Hi guys and welcome to another episode of 8-Bit Retro Refix and on this week's episode we've got the final numbers for your joystick giveaway so don't forget to watch out for that and get it add them up, get the numbers from all the other Saturday videos grab my email from the video, post it over to me ensure you are a subscriber picture of the joystick that you would like from that video and I'll get that repaired on next week's video and post it straight out to you so good luck on finding that guys absolutely cracking in last week's video when we did the um, Amiga 500 repair um, I did say in there that uh, if anybody commented if they wanted me to show them how to program um, chips um, so what we're going to do is today I'm going to show you exactly how we program an Amiga kickstart ROM or if you want to create a Diag ROM um, you will do it this way. I will also show you a few other little and bits and pieces you can do once you've bought the setup um, so you're not just limited to the, um, the Amiga chips you've got quite a wide array of chips you can program and deprogram and I'll go into that in a little bit later on. So you can see on the bench at the moment I've got a bit of an array there. This card at the back this came from out of a BBZ Micro there's a lot of EEPROMs on there. This is where from the days back in the 80s, early 80s, where the EEPROMs came out. So you all know, you've all heard, you know, of ROMs when you're downloading them. Well, it's the same thing really, in a sense. It's just that um, an EEPROM will be a pro, uh, erasable, programmable ROM. So what you see with like the original chips, like MOS chips, um, MOS PLAs, all in the original, they in effect themselves are a PROM because that would have been a programmable read-only memory so that's where you get PROM from so these chips that you can see in front of you with the little windows in that you can see these are what they call EEPROMs so they are actually programmable um, through that little window there that is how you would actually erase the chip you can see here all this is a timer box so I spin the clock around here switch it on Open the little drawer, there, is, there was a handle for it at one time. Open the drawer, pop your EEPROM in, pop it in, and just let the timer run out. And I'll show you back when we get back to my PC screen, when we're programming, what happens in there when you don't erase the chips, or you haven't got an erased chip. So you've got to erase the old ones with a little window like that, which these are an EEPROM, so erasable, programmable, read-only memory. There are other chips. This is actually my Commodore dead test cartridge, which has also got the diagnostic cartridge on it as well. So we just flick through these dip switches at the top here to just select which side and which part of the ROM that we want. Um, so yeah, but this one, if you notice, it doesn't have a window. I'll see if I can bring it up and let you have a look. I don't know how clear it's going to be. But this one doesn't have a window. So this one is an EE PROM. So that's a electronic, erasable, programmable, read-only ROM. So you can tell now by me rattling all that off um, why these get abbreviated down. But that means with this chip, in this cartridge, if I wanted to, I can wipe that chip, I can just stick it in the, pop it, the programmer, pop it in the programmer, click the button erase, it does that for you. And then click that button program, and it's done again for you, that easy. And if I made a mistake, I just hit erase and reprogram it, which is absolutely fantastic with an EEPROM. Problem is with these EEPROMs, is the, they're only programmable ones, you can only erase them once. So, when you're going about there, if you do make a mistake, it's going back into here. Every single time. So you need to make sure that you write these correctly the first time, otherwise you're going to have another 10, potentially 20 minutes running in here to erase these. There's a big thing about saying cover these up, as you can see on here. They're all covered up, aren't they? A lot of people rave on going, oh, you must cover them up. You've got to cover them up. Um, the ultraviolet light will come through and, it, and it, it will get to the 
program on there and erase part of the programs. To be fair, I would have said you'd have to be in Australia and put it outside for a, for a week or two for anything like that to be happening. You know, it's it's not that intensive. People generally just put stickers over the top of them so they know what's in them, to be fair. I do, because it is good practice anyway to put a sticker over the top. You know, I'm, after, in saying that and all that, if you've gone to the head of buying one of these programmers and writing these chips and doing all that lot, you're swapping them out and changing them about. You're really going to want to uh, protect them as best as you can, really, aren't you? So in last week's video, you watched me do the A500. Um, you watched our run the diagnostics test through there. This is the chip that I created to do that job because I was unsure on whether the kickstart run was gone in that one anyway because I was told originally it was a red screen which usually indicates to a kickstart run but when I actually got to it and started it up we had nothing but that were all in last week's video so this is one that I created so what you need to do is find out what type of ROM you can use so they usually come in a little strip box like this I'll see if I can get one of these out for you I'll try and put um, a picture up. I'll see what it's like when I'm editing. So this one, if you can read that, if we can keep it still long enough for you. So this one is a AM27C400. The way I found that out is I actually bought originally when I was um, wanting to get new kickstart ROMs for my Amigas and things like that. I um, I had one there for oh, is it Amiga Forever. I got some chips from them once. So what I did is I peeled back their sticker, um, which showed me what it said on the bottom of their stickers. So all I did is go into eBay and I, and I bought these ROMs. I've gone through quite a few now, I've put them in my 500s, I've put them in 600s, they're in my 1200s. Um, so yeah, so that's what we, that's how I actually discovered what chip I needed. So then I bought them chips, and I went and bought a programmer. If I remember rightly, it is a, I've forgotten the name of it, oh, TL. So it's a TL666CS, no 866, sorry, CS. This one doesn't have the little one on the end on here. You've got to be careful when you go out and buy these things. If they're genuine, absolutely fantastic. If they're not, do not update them with the software. If you update them with the software and it is not genuine, you'll end up with a brick. So my suggestion is, is make sure that they are genuine. Or if you have got one that's working for you and it's working for you, just don't update it. There's no need to. If it's working, why update it? No reason. It's just a little bit of a gamble if you do. And if you do, then you've lost it. You can't do anything anymore. So I bought this. And I thought, absolutely fantastic. I can now put one of these chips in here. Oops. I like to think I can put one of these chips in here. And I'll put one of these chips in here and I can raid it. Um... It didn't actually quite go that well. Because not knowing anything about doing any of these chips originally, I didn't have a clue about anything of any of this. I'm completely clueless, we're all self-taught. Um, so I bought this and it didn't work, and I thought it were me, and I thought it were my drivers in my PC, um, etc. And then I started looking around on the forums a little bit, and then realised that these chips um, are not actually compatible with this programmer. So when we go up with the PC screen, I'll show you the window that you can go in to change all these chip names, etc., and things like that. So I went in this window on the software and searched for that chip number. And yeah, guess what? It's not there. So then after a little bit of research, I found out that you needed to purchase one of these adapter boards. This adapter board, if I'm looking at it down at the bottom, it says um, a 27C C322 and other. So that's for this switch here. So I flip that switch down, so because we're programming others, 
at the bottom you can see there it says uh, 322, 100s, 300s, uh, and obviously 400s. You have to go on the internet to find all this in, info out on here. There's quite a bit. I'll see if I can find it and I'll pop it up if I can. But all these switched positions change all these for you. But for the ones that we're doing today, which are the Amiga ROMs, we switch them all up so they're on. So the switch down for this one and switch up for, for on. So that's what we do with that. So I'm just going to pop that back into that unit now for you. Just just watch it when you put them under. Make sure that the other the, the legs are in first. Look, and down she goes. And lock it in. So I've actually built that up now. So that's us set up to read these programs and read these ships. The other thing is, everything you read about these chips is the notch at the top. Make sure the notch at the top is in the right place. Make sure the notch at the top is on the sockets. Make sure the notch is the right way around. Get the notch, match the notch up. We're told this over and over and over and over again. Every time you go around programming these chips, everything's over. So, so if we're going off that rule, that the notch at the top goes here. So you think, oh well, if I actually look at that program there, there's some little marky legs up there, look. You see them? Separate, it's like three pins, four pins, and then a load, and then, so you think they move around. So you think, right, okay, so that chip needs to go up at the top, because it needs its notch at the top, up there, like that is. So that's true to form. That is true to form with all programs and all chips. Notch at the top of the socket, always. Pin one. So, when I started to try and program these chips, I was getting errors all over. Wouldn't read them, wouldn't do anything. I started thinking, have I bought a load of duff chips? Put them into here, erasing them, leaving them there for a half an hour, putting them back in, doing a read to see whether it's blank, or what they call a blank check. You'll see that when I go over. Blank check failed, blank check failed, blank check failed. And I thought that was really strange. So what I did is I took the, the Commodore cartridge that I showed you earlier that's an electronic programmable, uh, electronic erasable programmable ROM. And I took all this off and I stuck that into there and I read it straight to my desktop. Perfect. It erased instantly. I programmed it straight back. I put it back into the Commodore 64 and tested it. Spot on. No problems at all. So I brought it back again. I erased it. Reprogrammed it. Put it back in the Commodore. Perfect. No problems at all. So that told me that, you know, actually, all this gear was working. There's nothing wrong. So that's why my head started thinking, you know, I wonder if you did this bad lot of chips. And then... I was doing a little bit more research on web and I just saw one of this picture and it caught my eye. And it caught my eye. And none of it in the literature or anywhere that I could find would, would tell you this. This is just what I found. So what you have to do is, that ain't put it there. You put it at the back and lock it down there. Now, with it in that position, it's going to program perfectly. Every single time. Beat nobody tells you that in any of your paperwork. So I just thought I'd give you that little tip out there, guys. I know many people struggle burning uh, kickstart ROMs. Um, but this setup, it's every single time. So with that, and now we know we can burn ROMs, there's lots of other little things you can do. So before we go ahead and burn this ROM, I'm just going to explain... A little bit more of what other things you can do. So I've already explained about the Commodore 64 dead test cartridge kit that I have over there where you can burn it and change it. Okay that's fair enough, that's great. But you all know about these PLA chips don't you? Packing up all the time in the Commodore 64s. So what I did is I went online and I bought this one and somebody were advertising it as a PLA EEPROM. So I could have bought it 
built up, soldered up. But I thought, no, I'm not going to do. I want the software off it. So that's not soldered in there, it's just pushed in to keep the legs straight and stuff like that. So what I'm going to do eventually, I haven't done it just yet, is I'm going to dump that and then I can find out what's in it. And I'm going to put in there, I'm going to build it and I'll put it into the Commodore 64 as a PLA chip. And if it works perfectly and no issues at all, I'm going to find out what these chips are and get hold of a few. Because we all know what the PLA chips are like for the Commodore 64s, the SX, the 128s, etc. Stuff like that. So they're real handy for them all. So that's why I got it like that, and that's something else that you can do. You can build PLA chips for Commodore 64. You can build kernel ROMs if you want for the Commodore 64. So you want it to build your own kernel or your own character ROM or anything at all. So what I got is I got these little chip, order these chips online, because these marry to these boards. Do so what these do is convert the original the original Commodore 64 ROMs, which you can see in the board, they've got less legs. So that's where you would put your legs at the back, that would stick into the board. This is four stuck together, so it's not going to be like this at all, you just snap one of these off. So then you program one of your ROMs that you want, and then pop it in here. And the reason why we do that is, is because the pinouts, there's more legs on this one, and the pinouts are all wrong. So you can't see on that board anywhere. You can see a bridge there, can't you, across that one? Just here, when running across to that pin. There's another little couple of wiggly ones down there. I don't know if you can quite see that on camera. I'll try and fetch it up. And you can see them pins, jumpers, jumping across. So these are four boards. So all it does is move the pins. Another couple at the top there, up the top right corner of that, by the top of my finger. And they'll move around, look, it's a little jumped about. So you can see what they do is they change all that around. So you can make Commodore 64 ROMs if you want to, or kernel ROMs. So all these ROMs will be a lot more stable than what the original chips are. So that's what you can do with, with that. Just flicking back to PLA a little bit that we spoke about uh, when I was talking to you about this chip down here, this, this ROM that I got. There's also another way of making these PLAs, and these are these GAL chips. So you can buy these little boards, they all are available online, you can get stuff like that on GitHub. Um, I would imagine if you contact PCBWay and have a look through there, you'll probably find some boards that you can purchase off there, and you buy these GAL chips and program them, and these go as well, quite well as, as a PLA chip. So I've got a couple of these, I ordered these in because I wanted to have a look at them. All the information's online, You don't. I wouldn't need to buy these just to strip it down like the other one. I didn't know what it was, um, so I bought it. It was only very, very cheap. So I bought it just so I could strip it and reverse engineer and see what it's about. These gal ones, I could do the same with these gals if I wanted. Um, Desold them off the board, read them in the, the TL866. Dump the software off them. Make your own socket if you wanted and jump the wires across backwards and forwards. But I think these days it's that cheap to buy these boards. What's the point? You may as well just buy them, aren't you? And save yourself a load of headache and a load of time. Unless you want to go to that yourself and you enjoy doing that kind of thing yourself and creating these things yourself. But you could actually create one of these PCB boards if you wanted. Copy it off here. Create it on a software that allows you to do things like that. Once you've got the JED files, you can post them up to PCBWay or any other companies that produce these boards and they will make these boards and post them out to you. So you can actually make your own. So, so I'm going to go away from all that bit now. We've looked at that. I've showed you them. That's one last little, last little thing that I've got here, which I've just purchased recently, which I'm going to have a look and see if I can do it. I don't know whether I can or not. I'll have to find out um, what we need. But what we've got in here... Is apparently, oops, two seconds. Is apparently an original 50 Commodore disk drive, 
15.40. And that'll for the Vic 20. It's kernel ROMs and routines are completely different to a 1541. They're a lot faster. The Commodore 64 can't handle them kind of speeds. This is why these 1541s have also been notorious for being slow drives. That's why everybody created Jiffy DOS at a later date. But this is one of the original chips from the 1540, which would make it the fast drive. So I'm going to test it later on, um, but I want to dump the software off it as well, and then I could actually create some more. So I've got a couple of 1541 drives around, so I'm going to try and convert one of them back to a 1540, just so I can put it onto my VIC-20 over there. So I'm looking forward to having a play with that. So I might do another video um, playing around with that 1540 kernel ROM and seeing what differences are and speeds and stuff like that with the drives. So just thought I'd show you that. Let's go back to his Amiga ROMs. Um, what we've got here is that's the diagram. We've got his burner set up. We've got a chip in there ready to program. Got his blanks to test. I'll show you a blank test on that. As I said earlier, and I'll show you diff different bits and pieces what to do on the so on the software. So just going to move over to the PC now. And we'll continue there. Right, okay, we're back over at the PC now. So I've got the software up and running. I've got a Kickstart ROM here that we, we can make if we want, which is 3.1. And that's for the A500, 600 and 2000 ROMs. Down at the bottom, down at the options down here, in the left-hand corner, you've got Check ID. You want to make sure that's off. Um, verify afterwards if you want, and make sure you're doing a blank check. Okay, so now we're set up. Over here you've got the voltages. These get automatically set, hopefully, when you're up here in the IC checker. So if I click on there, that takes me into where it is. And that's the 27C4096 AMD. So it started AM40. Yeah. I know, okay, we talked about the chip being a 400, but it doesn't list a 400. And this, this selecting this dip chip will work perfectly. So like I said inside here, you can go in here. These are other ones that I've used before. Um, all your different ROM types are all in here. So if I go in there and do that, or we go into AMD in there, take that away a minute. So you've got all these different chip types. So even if you went for them, they've got a pile of chips here that you can set which one you need. Yep. So what I do is you come over here, you select all, you put in there 27C4096, gives you these, look under AMD and select that one and just select. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is just to show you um, a bit of difference, I'm going to put the diagram in. So the diagram's in the programmer, that's the, pro that's the diagram that we, we created. So if I go up to device now, we know it's not blank, we know it's got a program on, but I just want to show you what it'll do. So this is a blank check, so I'm going to check blank, and it just reports back as error. So that would mean that it need to go into that ultraviolet light it, erasing machine that I've, that I've purchased to, to wipe that out. Okay? So that's your blank checking. But we don't want to do that. So in effect, if we wanted to create a new diagram, what we would do is just go up to the top here, make sure that check ID is off because it likes to pop back on all the time. Go to device and click read. That opens us up, we click read. Done. So if I cancel that now, we don't need to look at that. What we've got inside here, I don't know if you can see highlighted over here. But although there near my cursor, it says diagram Amiga. So that's, that's the ROM that we've just dumped. So it's within this software at the moment. So if I wanted to save it, go to file, save. Um, we're on desktop. We'll just call it dump and save. So now we'll, what we've got here is the ROM file straight off that, that Diag ROM chip that I created earlier. So if we wanted to now, we could actually load that file. So you'd open up, go to your desktop, 
find the dump that we have there open when it comes up to this window some people get a little bit confused with it I did at first I didn't know what to do just click OK get rid of it so that's the software in there so if I take that out now that diagram and I pop one of our chips back in there so we've now got a blank chip back into the programmer what I always like to do is go down to a blank test and we'll just check that for a blank test first blanking so that checks it it's done we know we've got a blank chip that's great now so if we wanted to now we don't want to do that you want you want to admit a watch maybe do a, a kickstart rom so this is 3.1 rom that we're going to do here so i'm going to select that file now so i'm going to open that go down to the roms find us kickstart you click ok so this is your kickstart 3.1 image down here we go back to a device you think you'd go read or whatever on there, but it isn't. You look for program. Just while I'm here, if you look under program there and blank check in between them two, it's got erase E. That's for that other chip that I showed you, that electronic raisable. So you could actually blank it from here and reprogram and blank and reprogram and blank and reprogram if you wanted to. Um, but these chips, like we said, you have to go into an ultraviolet light to erase them. So it won't do it from here. So we're going to program this chip now. Um, we've got everything set up. There's auto checks off down there. It's going to do a verification. It's going to do an automatic blank check. We could de-check that if we wanted to, but hmm, just leave it on. It doesn't take long. All this should be set up down here correctly anyway. And we're ready now to burn ourselves a 3.1 Amiga 500 ROM. So I'm hitting the program. Away she goes. That's writing it to chip now. Done. I could be wrong around on that first stage because we've got the blank check there. I think it did a, a blanking check first before it set off. Now we're doing the programming. It takes a little bit longer. I mean, the blank check took 5,200 milliseconds to check. We'll see what this reports back once it's programmed. I don't think it takes too long, but I'll skip forward to the end anyway. So program there now, it's done, it's just doing a verification check, done. So it did take a little bit longer than what I thought anticipated to program. Not too long, probably a minute, something like that. Not even that, I don't think. But we've done, we've finished. So if you wanted to go back now and just go up to the device and click verify. That will verify whatever you've loaded up here in the open section in here. That will, ver that will verify against this chip. So we'll do a verification again. It's only a quick read. Done. So it's verified. We know it's done. I'm doing this just for hell of it. Do a blank check. Oh look, it's not blank. We know that. We've just written on it. You know, but that'll just assure you that it's done now. This ROM chip is now 3.1 Amiga. A500, 600 and 2000. You'd, if you were doing it for a 1200, you'd do exactly the same thing. It's just that you've gone A1200, you've got two chips. So this is why I ended up going down these routes of, of doing these, because I wanted to do them myself and learn how to do this. So the difference is with them is it's a bigger ROM. So they ain't room for it on one of them chips. So it was too expensive back in the day with Commodore and it was cheaper to get all of these other chips. So they created um, a high and a low. So that's the only difference there. I think it might be the same at 4000, not quite sure. But yeah, if you've got a 1200 and you want to upgrade, you've got a high and a low chip. Um, and you just do it exactly the same way here and pop them in. So I hope you've enjoyed this week's episode, showing you how to burn these chips. Um, and how to go along programming Amiga Kickstart ROMs. Uh, don't forget to collect all them numbers over the previous videos. Collect my email address, post it over. We're along with your username, YouTube username. And we'll take it from there, guys. Um, once again, thank you for watching another episode of 8-Bit Retro Refix. I really do appreciate all that you guys do for me. 
and we've done over 100 subscribers now. Absolutely fantastic. I know it doesn't sound a lot, but it does really mean a lot to me. Um, so onwards and upwards, and we can only improve and get better. So thank you very much for watching another episode. I know I keep saying it, so I'll say goodbye. Bye.